prioritize. What a mess! It's not the future we wanted, but the future that happened. Welcome to part two of John Barillaro, Escape to New York. We pick up the story after Barillaro has quit the New York gig, just as the parliamentary inquiry heads into its second day. In early July, Miss Jenny West, the person identified as the successful candidate in the first round of recruitment, gave her evidence. Fair to say, Jenny West kept her receipts. On 12th of August 2021, Miss Brown told me I was the successful candidate. She sent me a briefing signed by Premier Berejiklian, noting my appointment as Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner for the Americas. On 14th of August 2021, Miss Brown approved my request regarding my contract terms. On 14th of October 2021, I had a Teams meeting with Miss Brown at her request. She told me that I would not be getting the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner role for the Americas. Miss Brown said that the position, and this is a quote, will be a present for someone. She added, and I again quote, you are an extraordinary performer and I am upset that this has happened. On 19th November 2021, I received a letter terminating my employment, effective from close of business 30th of November. Until Ms Brown's in-camera evidence before this inquiry on 29th of June, I had received no explanation from Ms Brown or Investment New South Wales other than what I have outlined today. I am genuinely surprised by the matters raised now by Ms Brown in her evidence before this inquiry. Given those matters have now been made public, I believe I should be given an opportunity to respond to them, especially because many of those things said are inaccurate or even false. Then came a statement from Barilaro's former Chief of Staff. Mark Connell, claiming that in 2019, Mr Barilaro had a meeting with then Treasurer Don Perrottet and Senior Minister Stuart Ayres and announced they were going to recall the Agent General in London. This is it, said Mr Barilaro. This is the job for when I get the out of this place. Mr Connell replied, but John, the Agent General role will be filled well before you retire. I don't want to go to London, that, said Barilaro. I'm off to New York. When Connell pointed out our current office is in California, Barilaro allegedly replied, I'll get them to put one in New York. That didn't sound good. A few days later, Barilaro found himself in enough hot water to make a lobster feel uncomfortable. Good evening. Former Deputy Premier John Barilaro is now being investigated by police for allegedly assaulting a cameraman. The first rule of Fight Club is... At one point, the microphone was seized and thrown into the bushes. Then, when a second freelance camera arrived on the scene, tensions rocketed. Mr Barilaro paced towards him, lunges for the camera, his hands raised, but he walked. The cameraman followed, at which point Mr Barilaro's friend, believed to be a former media officer, also jumped in, followed by the 50-year-old. With Stuart Ayres' name popping up in documents and emails, he was forced to come out and defend himself. Well, I've not done anything wrong. There is no reason for me to stand aside. I've tried to say time and time again that the recruitment of senior trade and investment commissioners has been a role explicitly for the public service. The government, if it changes its policy settings, can conduct a different recruitment exercise. But it has not done that. It has consistently made sure that the government is at arm's length from the decisions on who forms these roles. That whole arm's length thing would come back to haunt him. Late last night, uh, Minister Stuart Ayres informed me that he would resign from his ministerial positions and as Deputy Leader of the New South Wales Parliamentary Liberal Party. His intention to resign follows a briefing I received <clears throat> from the Department of Premier and Cabinet Secretary Michael Coote strode yesterday afternoon on a section of the draft Graham Head report relevant to Mr Ayres. I subsequently discussed the issues raised in that briefing with Mr Ayres. Mr Head's draft findings raised a concern as to whether Mr Ayres had complied with the Ministerial Code of Conduct. 
Yes, so the, the issues in the review go directly to the engagement of Minister Ayres with the Department Secretary in respect of the recruitment process. In, in, the advice I've received is in relation to engagement with the Department Secretary um, in respect of influence on the decision-making so process. You, what was that? Is it your expectation that Stuart Ayres will stay on as a Member of yes. Parliament? Yes. When I spoke to him last night, he told me that his intention was to remain as the Member for Penrith. While the headlines may all use the word resign, the reality is he intends to remain a Member of Parliament and therefore continue to collect a $170,000 a year annual salary. Not a bad gig for napping on the backbench. It's all well and good for the Premier to have concerns after the event, but where were his concerns in April when he first learned of the impending appointment? Between the 1st of April, after the first you made the decision that Minister Barilaro was the person for the job, did you contact Minister Ayres' office? Uh, yes. Did he express at that time, between 1 April and 30 April, any time in that month, any concern about your decision to appoint Mr Barilaro? No. He's told the Legislative Assembly that I informed the Premier and the Deputy Premier of this recommendation on the 30th of April via a phone call. Later that day, Amy Brown returned for round two of her evidence. This time she was a little more forthright in her telling of Stuart Ayres' involvement. Welcome to round two. Did you feel like Minister Ayres was keeping himself arm's length from this process? Um... I would say that, objectively speaking, arm's length is not a fair characterisation of how the process was run. When I ask you, was Minister Ayres keeping himself arm's length from this process, you're saying no. In my view, he was not arm's length from the process. There were multiple intersection points throughout. But broadly speaking, I wanted to make sure he was comfortable. On the basis of those six to seven to eight interact in major intersections, on that basis you concluded or you formed the impression that Minister Ayres was involved in the process? Yes. And on that basis you say he didn't keep himself arm's length? That's an accurate statement. From 27 September, um, 2021 onwards, I thought it prudent to have a degree of confidence that appointees will be capable of transitioning into a ministerial appointment regime if the change was eventually implemented. Any conversations I had with Minister Ayres were therefore, to a degree, influential on my decision. But in my view, it did not amount to undue influence because at all times I felt that the decision was mine, ultimately mine to make. It is probably easier to dump on the boss once they've resigned. The New South Wales Public Service Commissioner has been left feeling as though her involvement in the recruitment process was to lend it some sort of legitimacy or provide cover. I have recently become aware, including through evidence given at hearings of this inquiry and through media reports, of various matters relating to this recruitment process. This includes the degree of ministerial involvement including input into shortlisting and provision of info an informal reference. I was not aware that informal references were sought for any candidate, nor was I aware that the Minister met with Ms Kimberly Cole. I have also recently become aware that the treatment of the third ranked candidate in the report did not accord with what I believed would occur. Had I known on 15 June what I know now, I would not have endorsed the report. The other independent panel member, the Honourable Warwick Smith AO, who has not been called as a witness before this inquiry, would like me to put on the record that had he known then what he knows now, he also would not have endorsed the report. As Public Service Commissioner, I should not be viewed as cover for a recruitment process or as a way for other panel members or the hiring agency to avoid accountability. I was not aware of the number and nature of interactions between the Minister and the Secretary and I also was not aware of what I believe is relevant information that should have been disclosed to the independent panel members. And that includes um, the fact that Ms Kimberly Cole met with the Minister. I do not know what the outcome of that meeting was other than what I heard um, in evidence given at these hearings. I do not know whether that outcome 
was factored into the selection panel report, which was presented to me to review and sign. I did not know that informal references were sought. I do not know who those references were sought from. I do not know the content of those references. Um, and I do not know whether those references were factored into the selection panel report, which was presented to me for review and signature. Um, there is another matter that's problematic, which is the third ranked candidate on the selection report and how he was treated. When I said I, it, it was possible that I was used as cover, um, that is based on um, evidence I've heard given to this inquiry. So what evidence have you heard in this inquiry that's led you to have, feel that? References to the Public Service Commissioner being on the panel. That was being made by the Secretary? Yes. So you think perhaps it is the case that the Secretary has been using you as cover? To, to I don't know. But is that a conclusion that's possible? Possible. Is that, how it made you, is that what led you to that feeling? I was concerned. The Independent Public Service Commissioner who was on the recruitment panel with me can confirm this. You can see why the Public Service Commissioner might be feeling a little aggrieved. The more information that comes out, the more this whole saga seems to stink. One thing that's got me thinking is just how necessary are all these plum international jobs to New South Wales. The New South Wales Government have created a bunch of positions, paying each of the sticks around half a million dollars a year. And that's on top of the office expenses and other staff employed to work for each Trade Commissioner. Just how critical is the Trade Commissioner role when you can apparently afford to leave it vacant for more than a year? Take New York as an example. Even though the Commissioner role is on hold, the Commissioner's office currently continues to expand. So at the moment there's three, um, and I think by next week there'll be four. So we're hiring additional one? Yeah. We're so we're expanding the actual size of the America's office despite not having a commissioner, is that fair? That's correct. Well, as it currently stands, due to the inquiry, the position's on hold. How does that even make sense? It feels like a lot of taxpayer dollars are being flushed down the toilet in this whole exercise. With Barillaro himself yet to give evidence, stay tuned for part three of John Barillaro. Escape to New York. New York. New York.